Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Every last one of us is at a different place in our walk with Christ, and invariably, when we start to share our convictions with other believers, we'll quickly find out that we're not all going to agree on every last detail. And so today in our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we'll work through several principles for how to handle these kinds of situations. And so welcome to the Key Chapters podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And this is our daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of the Bible. Today we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now as we start chapter 8, Paul is continuing to address the kinds of things that the Corinthian church wrote him about regarding some problems going on in their church. And so he has just answered their questions about divorce and remarriage in chapter 7. And now he shifts his focus to whether or not Christians should eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And so Paul says in verse 1, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Okay, so Paul's talking about food sacrificed to idols. And more than likely, you probably haven't seen a whole lot of animal sacrifices going on lately. And this might at first seem irrelevant to us, but before we file this chapter away in the not for me folder, uh, let's step back and look at what Paul is talking about and see if we can glean any principles for our lives because we end up learning a lot about how to work with others who have different convictions than we do. So what's going on? Back then, idol worship was everywhere. The temples would dot their towns and their villages much like churches would today. Often, animals were sacrificed at these temples and the meat from these sacrifices was sold to the public. And so you could go to these temples almost like like little butcher shops and, and buy Zeus burgers and Athena Franks and Diana dogs and things like that. Now, before becoming Christians, this is what most people did to get meat. But then, once they become believers, they begin to view things differently. And so some people had no problem still going back to these temples and buying their meat from them, Other people couldn't get past the fact that anything associated with idol worship was wrong. And so the Corinthian church was divided about this issue. Some people said it's fine because there's not gods anyway. Others were just feeling guilty about it. Now, it's not hard to imagine the kinds of arguments or the kinds of points each would be making in this debate. Those who thought it was wrong had pretty good scriptural support. Throughout the Old Testament, the Jews were commanded to avoid the pagan idols and those who disobeyed were often killed in the judgment of God. Likewise, in Acts 15.20, we saw this a couple weeks ago. Uh, In Acts 15.20, several Jewish leaders had that counsel and they told the people to avoid things polluted by idols. And then in 1 Corinthians 10.20, a couple chapters from now, Paul tells them that eating in a pagan temple was wrong because that was tantamount to worshiping that God. And so there were good reasons to say, yeah, I'm just going to pass on these Zeus burgers today and not eat that meat because they knew it was coming from a pagan temple. Now, on the other side, people looked at the problem theologically and they said, hey, you know, guys, there's only one true God, right? It's Jesus. And therefore, since all these other gods are false and fake, even if this meat did come from a pagan temple, it's no more contaminated than if it came from Joe's all-you-can-eat barbecue down the street. And so that was the basic gist of their debate. But it's one thing to disagree, and it's another thing to harm the unity of the church for our preference. And so when Paul turns to this topic, notice in verse 1 how quickly he gets the corrective instruction in verse 1. Looking back at verse 1, Paul says, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Just boom. Paul is saying, folks, before we even get to the merits of the issues, don't let your knowledge turn to arrogance. Make edifying love your first priority. Don't be so bent on winning the argument that you end up harming a brother. I find it interesting to see the word for knowledge that Paul uses here in this passage. In the Greek, it's the Greek word gnosis. And gnosis does indeed mean knowledge. And so it's a good, deep knowledge. But it is not the the deepest or the highest knowledge. Paul often calls us to a higher knowledge that he calls epinosis, which is where we understand the issues and we see how all of the pieces pull together. So these folks had good knowledge, but it was still just gnosis. It was the kind of knowledge that did not have the added ingredients of wisdom and love. And so the result of this knowledge was that it puffed up the pride of the individual rather than edifying the other people. Now that word puffed up here occurs six times in this letter. It's this idea of being puffed up, just a vivid picture of how the Corinthians viewed themselves. They were literally getting big heads over their so-called knowledge. So they had knowledge, 
but they lack love for one another. And ultimately that led them to harming their brothers and sisters in Christ. And so this first verse gives an important principle in making decisions about areas where there is honest disagreements between faithful brethren. The goal and the orientation of our heart and mind and will and focus needs to be directed towards edifying love of others. And so rather than just trying to win arguments, our goal should be to care more about our brethren than for ourselves, and we are to seek to bless them and edify them. And then once that's our mindset, once Paul establishes that as the principle, then we go on to verses two and three. Now, as we talk about verses two and three, we need to remember that, remember the first couple chapters of this letter, there were these, this long, one long injunction for us to proceed prayerfully and spiritually to make sure we have the mind of Christ. Like, guys, pray on up because I'm going to say some stuff that's pretty hard for you to hear. We need to keep all that in mind as we come to verse two, because Paul says, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing as yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Paul's point is that if we are spiritually minded and if we're growing in Christ and if our mind is being increasingly transformed to the mind of Christ, then the truths of verses two and three will be true of us. What are those truths? Well, that those who have this knowledge, this knowledge that Paul is talking about here, should be humble enough to recognize that they still have incomplete knowledge. They haven't learned everything. They still have more to grow, more to go. Now, I could tell you myself personally, I've got seven years of formal classroom training in the Word of God, and yet I still have so much to learn. I can't believe just this whole, this whole year going through this podcast with you has been so fantastic, and the Word of God is just this delightful treasury of ever-increasing epinosis into God's message for us and the implications for our life, and so none of us have arrived, and that's a fundamental principle we see right here in verses 2 and 3. That being said, it's not as though knowledge is what gains us a standing with God. It's not as though God's like, you know what? I was going to hang out with him, but he doesn't know enough. It's not as though God is impressed with knowledge. He's not. A person might have all kinds of knowledge and still not be in fellowship with God. And so Paul slips in verse three saying, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. In other words, what matters to God is your love for him. If you're starting on out in Christ, and if you're just listening to this podcast, trying to get a handle on the word of God, then know this. God is seeking your heart devotion to him even more than he's seeking your head to be inflated with knowledge. If knowledge does not convert our will to greater love for others and a greater obedience to Christ, it is not served a righteous purpose. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And so with that established in verse four, Paul then adds some of the doctrine we need to keep in mind. And so Paul says in verses four to six, he says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. And so Paul is establishing here now this biblical view of reality. Of course, idols are fake gods. They're not real. There's only one true God and there are no other gods besides him. Even if everybody else follows other gods, they're all false gods. We only follow the one true God. And so, yes, the, to the folks who are saying it's okay to eat these Zeus burgers because Zeus is not real anyway. All right. Yeah, that's true. But there is more to consider than just walking a theological tightrope. And we see that in verse 7. Paul says in verse 7, However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. And so, while it is true that there are no idols, not everyone has fully come to recognize this point. And for these people, if they eat that Zeus burger, their conscience is defiled. So Paul's point is that we need to keep the conscience of our brother or sister in mind when we live out our freedoms. Things that may be technically right may still harm others. How? Well, by violating their own conscience. A week and a half ago, we were in Romans 14. We studied Romans 14, 23, and Paul says there, whatever is not of faith is sin. And we explained that when a person does something that they think is wrong, it's a sin no matter what, because in their heart of hearts, they think they're sinning, which means that in their own hearts, that thing is more important than the God, and therefore it's an idol that needs to be crucified. And so folding that principle in here in verse seven, if a person violates their own conscience, they are sinning, even if the actual act that they're doing is not technically a sin. And that's because they're violating their conscience. Now, what is our conscience? 
Well, let's start by saying that, first off, that the conscience is not the Holy Spirit speaking to us. The Holy Spirit may guide our thoughts down a certain path that activates our conscience, but our emotions are not the Holy Spirit. Instead, the conscience is an inner mechanism given to us by God, which activates our emotions and our will to behave in accordance with the standard of righteousness that we hold to. And when we do things that we think we shouldn't have done, we feel guilty. Now, this standard can be formed from our culture, our peers, what our parents told us, what the Word of God says, maybe even our own opinions. And this is why in verse 7, Paul tells us that some people can have weak consciences. Now, a weak conscience does not know whether an act is right or wrong. It's not been properly trained by the Word of God to have clarity on an issue, either right or wrong. And, And in this passage, the person with a weak conscience is wrestling with whether or not they should eat Zeus burgers. And since they're not convinced either way, they have a weak conscience because it does not ring out clear and true one way or the other. And Paul's point in verse 7 is that when a person violates their own conscience, they're defiled. Now, what does he mean by this word defiled? Well, the word defiled means stained or impure. And so, in a word, they're, they're sinning. Now, we need to train our conscience by the word of God. And sometimes it feels guilt when it shouldn't. And sometimes it doesn't feel guilt when it should. But we're not going to grow in Christ by constantly ignoring our conscience. If we feel guilty about something, we should stop whatever it is we're doing that's making us feel guilty. And so, to go with Paul's point here, if we tell a brother or a sister, hey, don't don't feel guilty about that, just do it. Well, what we're doing is we're short-circuiting the sanctification process of God in their life. Now, Paul does expect that a weaker brother will grow out of their weakened state, but that kind of maturity doesn't happen when we ignore our conscience. We need to train it with the Word of God and then live by the Word of God. And since we're going to be at different places in the process of this training by the Word of God, there will be times where what we think is okay may not be okay for someone else. Sometimes we'll have the weaker conscience and what we feel guilty about is actually okay. Sometimes the other person has the weaker conscience and sometimes we'll actually be wrong that what we're doing is not okay. We just haven't grown in Christ enough yet to see that. And so then Paul gives us some principles to handle that dynamic in verses 9 to 12. Verse 9 says, But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block for those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. And so we have now slipped into an event that Paul is just kind of envisioning here. He's he's envisioning someone eating in the temple. And we know from 1 Corinthians 10, 20, just a couple of chapters from now, 1 Corinthians 10, 20, that eating in the temple is wrong because it's going to be associated with, with that idol worship there. So Paul was probably thinking about a situation where a person is able to be in that temple eating, but not participating in the worship, but their mere presence just looks like they are. And Paul is saying that doing this, maybe it's okay for you, but what you're doing may be a stumbling block for others. Now, a stumbling block is something where you just kind of throw it away if somebody else causes them to trip, fall. And the word emboldened here in verse 10 is the same word for edify. And so Paul is using this ironic vocabulary here to say that the person who is living by their own freedom is actually causing their brother to stumble and and they're edifying their brother in sin and not edifying them to grow in Christian maturity. And so what happens when this person is edified in this sin? Well, verse 11 says they perish. That word perish indicates that we're doing something that's truly terrible to them. And when people's behavior uh, causes their other brothers to stumble this way, not only they sin against their brethren, they also sin against Christ. Paul says in verse 12, But when you thus sin against the brethren, you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. You sin against Christ. When we tempt our brother or sister to sin, we're not only causing them to sin, but we're also sinning against the Lord ourselves. And so because of the high cost of living by my freedoms, Paul says in verse 13, he says, Therefore, If food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. And now we're seeing the marks of true spiritual maturity. We're seeing the kind of love that true knowledge and true wisdom produces. This kind of love thinks through our actions and modifies our own behavior in light of the impact we might have on other people around us. And the true love here, the true knowledge here, helps one another grow in obedience to God's word so that we might be faithful to the imprint of His Word in our life. And so that's 1 Corinthians in a nutshell. As we end this chapter, here's a couple things to pray through, be thinking through throughout our day. 
One, let's seek the Lord that he might train our conscience by his word to know his standard of right and wrong and that he would give us the grace and the strength to us and to our will and to our brothers and sisters in Christ around us that we would all walk in the righteousness of Christ and his word. So that's 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Thanks for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Till tomorrow, God bless.